two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventured piteous overthrows doth with their death bury their parents' strife. The fearful passage of their death-marked love and the continuance of their parents' rage, which but their children's end naught could remove, is now the two hours' traffic of our stage. Tell me a story. Draw me in, set the scene, background, theme, and now begin. In Shakespeare's Tempest, Antonio tells Sebastian what's past is prologue. That's to say, our past events lead us to our present actions. So when a story begins with a prologue, pay close attention. The prologue dates back to the 5th century BC, when the Athenian rituals in worship of Dionysus transformed into the first theatre, where the prologue played an increasingly crucial role. Traditionally, it's used to introduce the story and necessary context surrounding the following events. Often performed as a monologue addressed to the audience, the performer could be a character involved, an external narrator, or an omniscient god. But the prologue doesn't just provide important background information, it establishes the story's theme, captures our intrigue, and can even suggest the plot's outcome. When Walt Disney Studios moved over to the feature films in 1937, their prologues began in the form of a very familiar sight, the opening of a book. As Disney's style and imagination matured through the decades, the prologue manifested itself in many ways. Three common styles of prologue were being used. The famous storybook, the traditional ancient Greek form, and, of course, the song. Though it may be a common trope today, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was the first time the storybook was ever used to establish a film's prologue. This form of exposition specifies the story's nature as a classic fairy tale that we may have been read or read ourselves as a child. Beginning once upon a time, or long ago, the familiarity of the opening of a book comforts an audience, young and old, into a widely practiced ritual of reading stories. As expected, Disney's Golden Age makes frequent use of it. Snow White encourages us to read for ourselves, while Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty use illustrations and a nameless voice with the book to help smoothen the transition to animation. The Sword in the Stone even sings along with the text. A legend is sung of when England was young And knights were brave and bold Better yet, I bet you've never seen an exposition on a sword's blade before. Post-Golden Age, the method is still cleverly adapted in Disney's animations like Treasure Planet, which uses a holographic storybook, or Robin Hood, which uses Alan a Dale, a minstrel who paraphrases from inside the O in Once Upon a Time. The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh uses the storybook as a tool not only for the prologue, but throughout the feature, often in a very overtly fourth wall breaking fashion. The storybook, in whatever form it takes, is timeless. The book is a universal symbol of a story, and so it's what we always trust to guide us into the first act. But somewhere along the way, Disney decided an opening book wasn't enough to fully immerse us. It was a filter between us and the story, defining its clear, fabricated fiction. Take away that filter, and we're left to define the story ourselves. This is the essential nature of the traditional prologue, and the most direct method of exposition. It's effective even in the more modern features like Tangled and Moana. Beauty and the Beast opens with an immediately recognizable prologue, Shakespearean in execution. Importantly, it's a storybook prologue without the book. It tells the origin of a curse under which a prince and his castle were placed. It mentors a magic rose which becomes an important symbol of time throughout the story. It even mentions the manner in which the curse could, and eventually would, be broken. Laid out in stained glass form, the first portrait reads in Latin, He conquers who conquers himself. Like I said, pay attention. The prologue leitmotif is used throughout the film in reference to its first appearance.
First, the terror variation. A stranger here. Then, the ominous variation. Take me instead. Heal. You would take his place? No, no. Mysterious. Curious. And finally, the first time the true original theme is heard. And again, the brief original theme when Beast connects with his humanity. For a tragic drama variation. And to send it home, the transformation variation. As the curse is broken and he conquers who conquers himself. See, in Beauty and the Beast, there are two prologues happening at once the storyteller's monologue and the music itself. Both give us context, but the music also gives us a visceral understanding of a scene's importance later on when we hear it again. It sparks a subconscious shift of focus back to the prologue and the theme it represents. The curse and the hope in time to conquer oneself. After The Little Mermaid's modern stage musical style proved successful, Disney continued to develop this moving forward. So, in the spirit of the musical, the opening number became a fitting alternative to the classic prologue. Hercules even goes so far as to reference the classic Greek tragedy, only to flip the page from tradition to modern, led by a group of gospel singing muses with visual storytelling on every vase. Immediately, we know two things. One, we are in ancient Greece. And two, it's not the same old ancient Greece we know. The muses introduce the titans, a band of monsters hell-bent on spreading chaos and destruction. The same band of monsters we eventually watch Hercules defeat in the final act. They introduce Zeus, arguably the central catalyst in the story. Our villain's motives and our protagonist's subsequent actions are the results of this dude who we are seeing in this prologue. The song does exactly what the prologue is meant to do. It reveals important context and sets the scene. What's past is prologue, what's prologue is plot. The Hunchback of Notre Dame sits neatly between the traditional prologue and the song. A singer introduces us to Paris as we weave through the streets near Notre Dame Cathedral. Then, our omniscient character, revealed as Clopin, he addresses the onlooking children in spoken word, mentioning the mysterious bell ringer inside Notre Dame, before diving into the backstory in song form. As he sings, we become first-hand witness to the context. Using intense close-ups, dramatic reveals, and first-person perspectives, we thrust into a deliberate kind of visual storytelling more akin to live-action cinema than traditional animation. In The Lion King, the prologue takes a completely new form. It moves away from the direct storytelling aspect and instead focuses on a more abstract introduction. The purpose to present the overarching theme of the story, the circle of life. The lyrics describe the unending, unavoidable round that moves us all through despair and hope, through faith and love, till we find our place. Then, throughout the story, we watch as the protagonist, and everyone else around him in fact, learn to find their place. Visually, we're shown the same theme. We open with a rising sun, a symbol of the constant nature of the circle of life, more than that, we are shown a savanna where the animals are not only sentient, but conscious of a respected, undisputed natural order. We don't hear a backstory, we don't see any elaborate context. We only hear and see what is required of us as the audience. What is required to set the scene and illustrate the theme. It's a bit of a big leap from once upon a time. From the first ancient Greek plays, through the centuries of theatre and storytelling, right up to present day, the prologue has remained a lasting tool, symbolising the story as our cultural connection to each other. Throughout the 20th century, Disney redefined our perspective of storytelling with animation, 
praising modernity and tradition at the same time. These animations introduce the timelessness of the prologue to the contemporary world, forming a new and indelible connection not only to the world around us today, but to the world long ago and the world yet to come. Hi everyone, thanks so much for watching this new video. I know it's been a long time since I've made a video essay, but I am obviously getting back into it. Uh, it's taken me a lot longer than it used to because I'm trying to improve every single time. I really, really want to thank my Patreon patrons, especially those three down there from my 101 Dow patron um, setup. I'm really loving being on Patreon and using it as a as a basis for my work uh, and I think I'm just going to keep working at it and keep getting you all involved. Every month I'm still hosting a Disney discussion session, two in one day each month, and uh, they we talk about all sorts of things, so all you need to do is be a patron uh, for you know as little as one dollar a video and I show you things that you may not have ever seen from Disney and we talk about them and we get really excited and giddy about it all because we are we're all fans of Disney here. If you would like me to do more of this kind of stuff please do subscribe I get much motivation from that kind of thing and comment please if you have any insights on Disney and on the prologue or any other kind of theme that I've been working with please don't hesitate I'm always learning new things about Disney which is why I love it. Alright, thanks so much everyone. I'll see you next video.